So it's okay? Okay. So I will start uh, this talk about my tips, tricks, and pitfalls covered in six months as a professional front end developer from coming from an ex PHP guy. And I'm pretty sure I felt some spine shivering when I said PHP, right? Uh, so I'll talk about myself just a bit. I usually don't do that during presentation, but I think it's important that you know my background and how far did I came from so I can gather this this kind of feedback I'm offering you tonight. So yeah, basically I've been doing PHP for seven years and I regret nothing. <laughs> I worked with homemade frameworks. Raise your hands if you already work with homemade frameworks. Nice. I know the pain, guys. I worked with PrestaShop. If anyone in here made some PHP, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I worked with jQuery up to 1.7. Woo! and also the monster jQuery UI. And the most of front-end development I ever did during these seven years as, as, a, <laughs> as a PHP developer is Angular when I know <laughs> I'm very resilient. And also, back in the days, no bundles, no modifications. We used SVN. <laughs> And we had no tests. So, yeah, I don't know how. <laughs> Several. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> no. I'm in, in the internal company chat. We have a room called PHP Anonymous, which I'm part of. <laughs> But yeah, of course, this is not 100% true. I did some better stuff in between, but mostly it's what I've been doing in my early years as a developer. And during that time, my only real experience with the front-end world was doing some stuff on my own time and doing some pet project and Hello World style stuff. So, six, no, eight months ago now, I've been recruited by Futuris. And we're still recruiting, <laughs> just saying. And actually, I was recruited by Futuris during the cycle count we had last year, thanks to Andre and Justin and Yanni, who's not there, and other people. It was amazing, and it was really the opportunity of a lifetime, and I'm really happy. And somehow I asked them if I could join them as a front-end developer, even though my background was in mainly in PHP and like doing some actual front-end work for actual clients. And the guys were are just crazy enough to have said yes. So now I'm just going to show you like the five main points I learned doing real life project instead of not pet project that you do at home. So the first one is, do you really need that npm install save? There's several reasons to that. I'll go through some of them. First, does this remember something to anyone? <laughs> yeah, the left, let's say the left pad gate, which happened, I think, was March last year when a developer just decided to remove one of the most popular packages from NPM and from one day to the other, probably 90% of any packages on NPM started stopped to work because this one package was unavailable and one package that contained, what, maybe 10 lines of code. And of course, in the meantime, NPM made it so that this shouldn't happen anymore, but the pessimist in me can is persuaded that something similar may happen in the future. 
So when you're adding when you're adding some dependency to your project, try to think, okay, am I really really needing this? Should is this something really important? Can I can I rely only on this or can I rely do I have some other options if something goes wrong with it? Also, yeah, <laughs> same there is a myth on npmjs.com. When you're actually just adding some packages in your repository, I think who who in there has worked on a project and then some weeks or maybe month passed and for some reason you have lost your node modules directory or someone new joined the project and they need to install the dependencies and it's not working raise your hand if it already happened <laughs> yes this is because probably 90 to 99 percent of the packages on npm are coming with breaking changes on even the smallest versions and that's terrible and so if you're if you say yes to this question of should i npm install this package please i can only recommend to use the shink wrap command from npm to make sure that you lock the version of the package you're installing because otherwise yeah this will happening you will break your dependencies because npm versions well the packages on npm are just crap Uh, also, one other point I think that can be really important is that usually I know I do it is that when I install a package, I'm going to mainly use one percent of the package, and like you're going to use one specific feature of it. And if you're if you're going to do that, if you're going to only use one specific feature maybe you could just re-implement it because until we have some i know we have some uh stuff like roll up nowadays and things like that but we'll do tree shaking so they say i'm i didn't try roll up so i don't know if it's really efficient or not but and until we have some really efficient tree shaking stuff if you're only going to use one percent of a package just re-implement it it's not it's not bad if you reinvent the, the wheel once in a while, it's okay. And for example, in my current project I'm working on at Futurist, we are using some part of Bootstrap and actually now we we use Bootstrap at first to do some uh, UI and for the, the early stages of the application and it was fine that we included Bootstrap as a dependency but now that we have the final UI, we don't use much part of Bootstrap anymore. So instead, we remove Bootstrap from the dependencies and we just shamelessly copy pasted several files from Bootstrap and committed them to our repository. And it's just fine. You can do that. There's no shame in doing it. It's better than including the whole. Yes. Uh, it's fine though. No, mi micro packages are just okay. The only sad thing is that when you install micro packages, you will have maybe 10 lines of actual code and maybe one to 200 lines of test and documentations and license and things like that. But what? It's just that you're just downloading a whole lot of stuff only for 10 lines of code. It's not that bad, but it could be nice if we if we could just ignore all this stuff. Uh, so do you need to install <laughs> to do some MPM? Yes. That's true. Damn, I need to update this. What what is it now? Cycle. Ah, uh, it's run. So if it's cycle JS, yes, please do it. Uh, my next, probably most important thing I learned is to. It's something we I already did kinda in the backend world, but is to wrap your external your external dependencies. Uh, this 
is the best thing I learned because, for example, uh, still in my current project, at some point, uh, yeah, we're using React, and instead of just creating component by creating a new file and exporting some React.create class and defining our class, we're doing this. It's kind of the same thing. We still have our React stuff with a kind of render function, as you can see. But the actual React is wrapped in a function. We, worked, we wrote ourselves to actually wrap React. And this was really useful because at some point the project was already ongoing for some time. And at the time, the Flux architecture being used was Alt. And at some point, we, sa we said, hey, let's just get rid of Alt and use Re Redux instead. And because we used this kind of uh, wrapping around the external dependencies, we only had to change the internal uh, code of this wrapper, this kind of proxy for the external stuff. And 90% of the diff from the pull request uh, aiming to replace Alt with Redux look like this. And when you do this, and it's the only change to go from Alt to Redux. Obviously, apart from the file that was named Alt and no name Redux, it's really cool that you don't have to go through every file of your application. It just replace every import and every everything. So if you do that with, let's say, React now, you can easily switch from React to, say, Cycle.js. <laughs> oh yeah, this one is a bit opinionated, but I don't care. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the presentation. I do what I want. Uh, functional programming is love. Functional programming is life. Writing code in pure function. Obviously, you can't write a hundred percent of your application in pure function and in functional programming at some point you will need to have side effects unless your application is doing nothing in which case maybe you don't have to code it at all you will need to have some side effect but i kind of like the mantra of having a functional core and having side effects only on the outside of your core and uh, does everyone knows what functional programming and pure functions are? Yes, I guess. So I won't go to, I won't spend too time in this, but yeah, yeah let's just say pure functions, no side effect. They take args in, they send something out, always the same thing for the same arguments. It's super testable. There's nothing much m more easier to test than a pure function. And the thing that, uh, why I think this is the most important, also one of the most important stuff in this talk is that when I joined the company and like maybe in the first week I was put in my current project with, which was already ongoing for uh, probably a year, using functional programming is really helpful when you are a new developer or, or a new member of a team because uh, pure function and functional programming is super easy to understand. It's super easy to understand what does one function do and what's the purpose of a function and how to use it. And yeah, it totally helps one to understand how the project works. So be friendly with your new coworkers and start working with functional programming. Oh yeah, that's something also I didn't really grasp when doing some backend development is that performance matters. Because first, let's see how you handle performance problem in a from a backend point of view. You just throw money at it. Your application is running slowly, it's fine. Just click the upgrade button in your S3 or whatever and just buy it. More performance server, it costs nothing nowadays. Unless you're really, really bad and your code is actually really crappy, 
just upgrade your server and it's going to be really okay. But you can do this with front-end development, unless you're really rich and you want to buy a new ba MacBook Pro to every user of your application. Why not? I would use your application. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can do that. And it's so easy to create all N2 functions and have a lot of React component listening to a store or a slice, a slice of your state if you're using Redux. That's updating really often and then you have all your components updating every time and it's going to be very slow on the client side. And fixing those problems are not that difficult but it's really something you have to think about during the development not to yeah when when writing some code try to think about okay how is this going to what what's going to be the impact on the performances for the for my user uh, my next slide uh, well the previous speaker already made some work for me and I know Andre will approve this one, but did you accept our Lord and Savior TypeScript? <laughs> yeah, sadly we don't use TypeScript in our current project, even though we are currently trying to working on moving to TypeScript by basically renaming all the t GS file to TS file and making it work. <laughs> now, seriously, TypeScript is super awesome for from a developer point of view, you, it brings super quality of, of life because you have some awesome completion and you have static analysis. So basically you will have, I won't say no, but less runtime errors because you will try to access some property of undefined. And it's not that hard to write TypeScript. Basically, it's just a superset of JavaScript. So if you write JavaScript nowadays, you're already writing TypeScript, but you just don't know it yet. And yeah, I can only un encourage anyone to start using TypeScript because it's really simple to, to install and use. And from a developer point of view, it's really, really good. And now for my last slide, it's a special one I made for the uh, CycleConf 2017 edition. Something that you should know when you're a new front-end developer is that you should use CycleJS. <laughs> <laughs> because CycleJS is awesome. I Sadly, I didn't... Oh, and there's a typo. Awesome. <laughs> Great me. <laughs> So no, don't use CycleJS, use CycleJS Cy instead. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, seriously, I, I didn't have any opportunity to use Cycle in my professional work yet, but I really would like to use it because uh, I won't talk too much about Cycle because Andre is going to do a presentation about it. But from a developer point of view, just like TypeScript, uh, it's really appreciated to work with Cycle with everything working as streams, your your inputs, your events, your everything managing your managing your state from streams is really awesome. Uh, do you have any questions? I didn't expect any. <laughs> Because it's a feedback presentation, so I don't think anyone would have. What? Sorry. Yep. I. It's. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the best framework in the world, man. No, oh, I. Well, not maybe a hundred percent front end, but yeah. After working, I can say so much time, but seven years with only PHP, which is a really crappy language. And I can say it. I'm, I'm a certified PHP engineer, so I can say PHP is crappy. 
<laughs> no, you don't want to go down that path. <laughs> but yeah, I would like to stick to front end for some time because I still have so much thing to do, like, and to try like Elm or uh, Pure Script or things like that. That looks really interesting. And yeah, I think front end development nowadays has has a lot of things to offer to someone who would would like to try stuff and break things <laughs> because that's what we do. That's a good question. Uh, I think it's kind of weird. We, You can find some communities. Well, I think the communities are really segregated between the multiple frameworks and technologies that exist because in PHP mainly you have PHP of course you have some huge frameworks but there's not much great frameworks there are maybe I don't know three or four compared to JavaScript it's nothing and you know the JavaScript community really depends on the the community you're going to look for like, like I know for instance I'm going to talk a lot about that but the CycleJS community is really friendly and welcoming and on the other hand we talked about it earlier with Justin but the Elm community for example can be a bit more strict and closed and they only tend to accept things that they think is the way it should be done and yeah it really depends but it's nice though to have so much kind of communities and being able to go from one to the other and grab some ID from one, some ideas from the others, and try to build your own opinion and building your own techniques based on this. Well, thank you, everyone.